welcome back to my channel. Um, so, in this video, um, I wanted to t t talk to you about um, an article um, which has been doing rounds not that long ago on uh, social media and other places. And it's basically, this is in relation to ADHD, so not awesome. Normally in my videos I talk about awesome. This is um, specifically to do with ADHD, but even though it's not autism, the um, similar arguments can be applied to autism. Um, and indeed, similar articles have arisen about autism as well. So I thought I'd discuss it, and also of course, as probably many of you watching this also have ADHD as well, so it just thought it'd be like something to mention, talk about. Um, so the article I want to talk about is um, from the Guardian newspaper, uh, published in February of this year, and the title is, ADHD may have been an evolutionary advantage. And of course you could substitute that with autism if you want because other articles have said the same thing about autism. I was quite surprised that this type of article actually got into the Guardian newspaper of all places. It's more a kind of headline that you might see in the Daily Mail or in the sort of more gutter press. Um, it's not really something I'd expect to see in a, a more serious um, educated type of newspaper. So people might see this article and kind of like immediately think that this is, <clears throat> you know, they might be like, oh great, you know, ADHD may have been an evolutionary advantage. No, the operative word here is may, which is quite telling in and of itself. This is not something that, um, this is not a, a claim that can be made with any degree of uh, certainty at all. It's hypothetical. So, anyway, so let's just go over what this article says. So, it says, Research su suggests that traits associated with ADHD could have helped early humans when foraging for food. Traits such as distractibility or impulsivity might have been an evolutionary advantage for our ancestors by improving their tactics when foraging for food. It might have helped people seek out new patches for foraging. Dr. David Barak of the University of Pennsylvania, who was the first author of research, said the study offered potential explanation for why ADHD was more prevalent than expected from random genetic mutations alone and why traits such as distractibility were common. If these traits were truly negative, then you would think that over evolutionary time they would be selected against, he said. He analysed data for 457 adults who completed an online foraging game in which they had to collect as many berries as possible in 8 minutes. The number of berries obtained from each bush decreased with the number of times it was foraged. Participants could either continue to collect berries from the bushes in the original location or move to a new patch, although the latter cost them time. The team also screened participants for ADHD-like symptoms, although they stressed this did not constitute a diagnosis. That's also important to bear in mind. 
Finding 206 participants had positive results, the researchers found Find a 206 participants or you get a positive results. The researchers found that participants with high scores on the ADHD scale spent shorter periods of time in each patch of bushes than those with lower scores. In other words, they were more likely to abandon the current patch and hunt for a new one. The team found such participants gained more points in the game than those with lower scores on the ADHD scale. And then it goes on to mention limitations of the study, including that ADHD-like symptoms were based on self-report and that it's necessary to carry out experiments involving people diagnosed with ADHD and real-world foraging tasks, not least as the latter would involve far more effort to move between patches than online games. Michael J. Rice, Professor of science education at the University College London said ADHD may help in situations where physical activity and rapid decision making are highly valued. It's great to see experimental evidence from Barak that participants who score highly for ADHD are more likely to switch foraging activities in ways that can be characterised as impulsive. In our evolutionary past, such behaviour may sometimes have been highly advantageous. ADHD can be a serious problem, but it's a problem in large measure because of today's environment. It's a very social model there. OK, right, so that's the article. And many people read it, people who are not that educated in, in science. And because it looks good, oh, it's all feel good, it must be a fact, right? Well, no, because as we should know it's a lot more complicated than that. Now, uh, I'm going to go through now some uh, other articles around uh, genetics and evolution and also uh, some um, very good work that uh, Professor Russell Barclay, um, who's a well-regarded um, expert on ADHD, has shown which debunks this uh, pop science evolutionary advantage um, idea. Okay, so, and of course there are lots and lots and lots of problems with that study. If you've noticed them, do comment below. But there are many comment, um, problems in that study which we'll also get onto in due course. Uh, so, um, let's just get on to the nuts and bolts of this. Okay, so one article I came across um, explaining more in the way of the nuances and complexities of um, evolution is an article entitled When Evolution goes wrong. So here is what it says. Now, genetic changes can be neutral or harmful as well as beneficial. And some change can be both. Conferring benefits when a single copy gene is present and causing life-threatening disease when copies are inherited from both parents. Obviously, ADHD and autism are more complex than this because they're polygenetic syndromes, so they're not just caused by um, you know, a handful of genes, they're caused by many, 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 many genes. Um, so now, mutations are happening all the time. Some things can just be there, you know, they can just be there randomly. Just because uh, a trait exists doesn't necessarily mean that it has anything relevant for evolution. A lot of it is just junk. A lot of it is just random, you know, random stuff being passed down, which does not actually have any um, pros and cons for evolution. It's just there. You know, as long as, essentially, as long as um, a genetic trait can be passed down, so as long as um, 
the bearer of that genetic trait lives long enough to reproduce, that trait will get passed down. You know? It doesn't necessarily mean that that trait in and of itself is beneficial to the person carrying it. As long as, you know, as long as the person lives long enough to pass it down, it will get passed down. And yeah, and it says it's actually not assumed in evolution that every feature would have to give benefits. And this is a scientific article. I, I, wish, I didn't actually write down where it came from. I should have done. I just wrote down the headline. So I'm sorry, I can't actually tell you where I found it. Um, but it was a scientific article anyway. Um, but yeah. So, for example, recessive traits. There are situations where, features, where there are features out there which pop up from time to time which have no obvious benefit. So a disadvantage can just be there as one of these recessive traits that hides in a population or is normally hidden. Obviously autism and ADHD are polygenetic conditions, so they're more complex than now recessive and dominant. But still, um, you know, many people can carry kind of autism vulnerability genes and not actually have any of the traits or only have like a very, very small number that aren't causing them any problems. So, of course, these genes are widely dispersed in the population. No wonder they're going to get passed down. Because most of the people who carry them, you know, are not so disadvantaged that they can't go on to reproduce. Lots of people carry these genes who don't have any autism or just have a very few kind of weakly expressed traits. It gives the example of sickle cell anemia, which obviously is completely different to autism or ADHD because it's, um, you know, it's single cell, um, sorry, single, it's single gene disorder, single gene, single, I mean, you need, essentially, you, well, you need, actually, you need, um, you need, uh, two, you need to inherit two of the, um, genes, you need to inherit one from the mother and one from the father uh, of the sickle cell anemia gene to actually get the disease. Um, if you only inherit one, then you are a carrier, but you don't, um, you don't actually develop the disease. So if one of your parents gives you your sickle cell trait, mingling with a regular gene, then you, um, then you actually are resistant to malaria. But if, but if the parents, but if you get um, two copies instead of one copy of a gene, um, then it dominates and it gets very, very serious and you get it very bad and then you're not resistant to malaria and you have sickle cell disease. So um, that's an example of a recessive gene. It will persist because of the advantage of the other genes. A regular genes are either hiding it or occasionally having an advantage. And it outweighs the disadvantage of the unlucky individual who has a serious situation with the two copies in them. But that's um, sickle cell anemia. Obviously, autism is far more complex than that because it's many, 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 many genes. And none of the genes themselves actually cause autism itself. They just increase your risk. Um, and it's more interactive, um, but that's just to show how a disease can persist because of um, advantages that might come through, say, just carrying the gene as opposed to actually having the disease. There's no evidence that that applies to autism, although we, you know, as autism is way more complex than that, but that's just to give one example of how, you know, a negative something that is inherently negative can still get passed down um, because the actual disease itself is not negative but um, carrying the genes might provide some advantage to another, might protect you against another disease. Okay, I'm going to move over to the next video now to carry on now talking about um, how and why um, certain diseases or disorders 
um, can persist through evolution. So moving over to video number two now.